I spoke briefly about the newly released DOSBox Pure in a previous video covering DOSBox frontends. In this video I'm going to look at it in a little more depth. I'm not particularly familiar with RetroArch, so if I've missed something obvious let me know in the comments. Excited by the prospect of controller-based DOS gaming, you leap over to the GitHub page and download Pure, only to be greeted by a zip file containing an info file and a dynamically linked library. What gives? Well, opening the info file up in a text editor brings up the name LibRetro. According to the LibRetro site, it's a lightweight C-based application programming interface that exposes generic audio, video and input callbacks. Right. In layman's terms, you have your DOSBox emulator working as a core for the LibRetro API to interact with, and on top of that, we need a front end to provide a user interface. The official front end is called RetroArch, and there's already a million setup guides for that because it's not specifically for DOS, so we'll skip installation. First though, it's worth pointing out just how much support there is for this front end. It runs on almost everything from a Steam Blink to a Windows 95 machine, and such amazing flexibility is commendable. Once RetroArch is up and running, we need to install the DOSBox Pure Core. Thankfully, the install instructions are on the GitHub. Let's try Doom. Does Doom work? Of course it works, because John Carmack is no man but an immortal space wizard sent to us in our time of need. The DOSBox Pure menu is lovely in that retro DOS tech style, helpfully listing all the executables you can run and giving you the option to auto-load a particular executable by default each time you hit play. It was at that point I plugged a controller in, because that's how RetroArch is meant to be used. Just make sure you don't have another joystick already occupying the first spot, or you might confuse it. Likewise with any application that might alter the controller layout. Press Y to quit. Oh, that didn't work. Neither did that. Or that. Fine, I'll just hit Y on the keyboard. Because my controller was a wired Xbox 360 one and I was using a Microsoft operating system, it also took me an additional hour to untangle everything. From there, it's important to make sure that you have a hotkey set up in the input settings of RetroArch, so that you can access the DOSBox Pure in-game menu options. The fact that it was set to nothing by default on the 360 pad layout was ridiculous. Shame on you, RetroArch. After following install guides and configuring controllers and hotkeys, we can finally see what DOSBox Pure in RetroArch has to offer beyond simple emulation. This is Doom before. This is Doom after. The final result played alright actually. I wasn't ripping and tearing like I would with a keyboard and mouse, but as a proof of concept it worked. This is rendered almost entirely pointless by the port of PR Boom, a much superior core for playing Doom exclusively. You'll notice in the previous footage that the aspect ratio is wrong, so that's what we'll fix next in RetroArch. Head to Settings, Videos, Scaling, then set the aspect to 4.3. Blood was next on our list, a build engine shooter from much later in the decade. It ran perfectly without any problems and had the same controller layout as Doom by default. That's legitimately impressive. And then we come to Daggerfall. And the first stumbling block. Despite helpfully mounting the ISO file by default, running the game refused to work because it kept thinking I didn't have a CD in the drive. So I went and reinstalled the whole thing in the hopes that would fix matters. That didn't work either. Turns out you have to run a file in the archive called z.cfg alongside the executable in order to point the mounted drive to D instead of C. You also have to amend the initial mount with a free size command and yeah, Daggerfall is a pain. You're far better off playing Daggerfall Unity, trust me. It did recommend Future Shock during the installation process, so let's try that. Initially, it didn't work. I went through the installer again in the vague hope that would fix things, and much to my surprise, it did. Unfortunately, the game asks you for a call sign. This can be dealt with by using DOSBox Pure's on-screen keyboard. 
or just by flailing about at your own keys like I did. When I got in game I discovered the menu needed mouse support. I tried to rebind the controller so that one of the analog sticks acted as a mouse but no dice. So I cheated a little and used the mouse to start. To my shock and surprise, after beginning the game proper, everything just worked. In fact, this was even smoother than I remember when I played it last year. Batter up! Turns out the cycles count was wrong. Just look at this battle as an example. DOSBox Pure allows you to fix that. Once I had it down to a 486 level it was much happier. And I actually had fun with the bullet spongy enemies. So we've established that some games work well and others need a little bit of TLC. Now let's have a look under the proverbial hood and explore this in-game menu system. You can save and load states with rollbacks like other console emulators and restart and close the game from here, should your game require you to press the Y button in order to leave. You can also stream and record yourself directly from RetroArch but the real meat and potatoes is in the options. You can create a specific options file for a game once you've tuned it to perfection. This will prevent RetroArch from overriding it. The bind unused buttons function supplies keyboard keys to buttons that are unused. And you can even bind the mouse wheel if you want. There's an on-screen keyboard function for when you really want to hit the Y button to exit. And an unexpected blessing is mouse sensitivity options a godsend for when you're using a thumbstick to mouse over things. The most impressive part of DOSBox Pure is that it uses the Key B to Joypad project by Jemmy Murphy and Big Jim. This means that if your game is detected, a gamepad mapping will automatically be supplied for it. It's hit and miss and you'll probably have to fine tune some things yourself, but it's far better than your button mashing doing absolutely nothing. The other convenient feature of Pure is that it gives you historical context for the cycles count that you choose to emulate in the emulated performance settings. Future Shock didn't work well with auto cycles, but you can clearly see it operates well on a 486DX266 MHz machine that was out at the time of the game's release. This prevents cycle count guessing for newer users, who can look up when the game came out and use this menu to figure things out if auto and max cycles somehow fails them. There's built-in aspect ratio correction as mentioned before should you not want to set it in RetroArch and all the usual DOS box features like SVGA mode and memory size are here. You can also change the sound emulation settings here, but generally the default Sound Blaster 16 will see you through. And sometimes in order to change things up you'll also have to load the game's DOS setup file from the menu so the game knows what device it's playing through. The music on the other hand is worth altering. If you scroll down to MIDI output it'll tell you to put an SF2 file in the system directory. So I threw a sound font in there and restarted RetroArch. When I go to the MIDI output of DOSBox Pure it now gives me a sound font to choose. Unfortunately the main MIDI settings in RetroArch don't seem to change things in Pure, so mixer control is still in the hands of either a text file from DOSBox or the game's internal sound settings. This means if you use a particularly loud sound font like Maxi Mabby's Arachno, <laughs> Ouch. Just like with digitized sound, if the zip containing your game uses Sound Blaster emulation or PC speaker for music but supports general MIDI, you'll have to go into the setup executable in order to change that. MT32 support has just been added too, but I didn't test that. Once options are calibrated you can alter the layout or change rewind settings. Yes, that's right, you can rewind certain DOS games now. But the most important part of the experience is the controls. These have already been helpfully mapped out, but here you can fine tune things, like shooting with the trigger instead of the bumper. Mouse remapping support is still an issue, as evidenced by this post from the creator a mere 11 days before this video, but hopefully they'll get that sorted by version 1.0. Because of the way RetroArch and Pure run, cheats are a possibility too but of greater interest is the disc control. This allows you to mount indexed images through an M3U playlist automatically and change discs should the game request it at the touch of a button. Fantastic compared to the original DOSBox image minder. Shaders can radically alter your image, from changing how the pixels are interpreted to simulating CRT scan lines. 
I like my pixels pixely, personally, but it's another nice inclusion. Because I don't use RetroArch much, how many of these options come as standard with it and how many are a result of DOSBox Pure is something well worth investigating for the curious. The GitHub contains plenty of documented features should you want to know what it's bringing to the table specifically. Overall, DOSBox Pure is a huge leap in the right direction for the seemingly impossible idea of DOS couch gaming with a controller. And despite a few hiccups and rough edges, I was very impressed and will be keeping tabs on the project. While it's not quite plug and play like console ROMs are and you might still have to occasionally battle with DOS installers and set up executables, the hard work of key mapping and editing the text files and guessing cycle counts has been diminished considerably. Bernhardt Schelling's core is brilliant and you should definitely try it out. Highly 